I haven't even got my jacket off yet. Come on. Um, well, while I'm thinking of a smart answer, you guys introduce yourselves, please. <laughs> Take it from the top. Uh, uh, Steve Taylor, cheers, Ty. <laughs> Mike Mead. Dave Perkins, left field. <laughs> Steve Taylor. <laughs> Actually, it's Lynn Nipples. Ray James. Okay, so what brings you to Greenbelt? <laughs> anybody? Steve's uh, persistent nagging. <laughs> quite obnoxious I was, but uh, yeah, they finally, uh, mm. we, uh, well, I, I, I told them, they were, uh, they'd heard a lot of good things about it, but it's not until you, I think, you get here and you, you see what it's all about that you get the full, uh, the full effect, and um, I, uh, I think we've all, uh, we've all quite enjoyed ourselves so far, so it's good. The green belt effect, huh? Yeah, that's right, the green belt effect, that's good. <laughs> yeah, well, can you just tell me, um, Yes, yeah, Steve, how did the band get formed? I mean, you were a solo artist last time you were here? That's right. Um, Dave and I worked together on the uh, I Predict 1990 record. We are, we are the Beaufort Twins. For all of you who uh, like the Black Adder series, you'll find an obscure reference to the Beaufort Twins somewhere in the first series. And uh, uh, Dave was the guy who played me all the first Black Adder series, so that cemented our friendship even further. <laughs> and. Um, well, let's see. We were working on, uh, I, I did a, uh, a compilation record, the last thing I did, which is called uh, Appropriately the Best We Could Find. And um, we were doing a couple tracks for that, and Dave and I were working together. And uh, while we were working on it, Dave started talking about, you know, we ought to, we ought to just form a band. We ought to just, just start from scratch and form a band. And I thought, oh, that's an interesting idea. Anyway, we were in uh, California, and my wife and I share a, a little flat, um, uh, just about a two bedroom and it, and it was uh, during a, a one bedroom flat and we actually used the bedroom for an office and we sleep in the dining room and um, Dave in order to save money Dave was uh, gonna sleep on our floor um, but he had one of those blow-up mattresses right and this blow-up mattress was during a, an extreme heat wave when we didn't really have any air conditioning so sometime during one of the nights while Dave was sleeping on this blow-up mattress this mattress um, the seams popped because of the heat and it turned into like a, uh, what do you call it, like a, go goiter. Like a goiter. Uh, do you have that word uh, on, the, on the deal? Sorry, no, not a good word. Um, so, a hideous growth. It was a growth, yeah. <laughs> a large boil, I don't know, whatever. And so I wake up in the morning and Dave's kind of wrapped around this uh, growth trying to hang on for dear life. <laughs> and sometime during the night he had come up with the concept of the name of the band. And the next day we're sitting at the mixing board and he wrote the name Chagall Guevara down on a piece of paper, slipped it to me on the mixing board and said, Eureka, that's the name of the band. And that was it? And it was, it was birthed from a fever dream <laughs> that night. And uh, the story, as the story unfolds, Lynn was working uh, at the record company that both uh, Steve and I were recording for at the time. So Steve and I launched uh, an insidious plot, uh, or as Baldrick would say, a cunning plan, <laughs> to undermine Lynn's power and credibility at the label, and effectively to get him released from his job, which, as you can see today, we were successful at doing. And uh, the only other thing left to do was to get uh, per permission from Mike's parole officer for him to be in the band, and to uh, retrieve Wade from uh, uh, hairdressing school. And, uh, That's the story. So Chagall Guevara means hideous growth, huh? <laughs> yeah, Dave, how did you get the name and how long have you been a Christian? Oh, I get stung by a wolf. Really? Well, it's nearly the, I thought it was. It's <laughs> playing my ear. <laughs> uh, the name was, um, I don't think it was ever intended to stick. It was just uh, it was it was it was just one idea at the spur of the moment, and it and it stuck. It was a bad joke come true. Would you like to explain what the name means then? Uh, there's uh, 
actually there's no there was no real intent behind the name but as an afterthought um, we've come to be fond of it because of uh, getting to know each other and the, and the different parameters of the uh, the group it's a uh, it's a diverse consciousness within this group on uh, on virtually every level mm. and um, the contrast in, in uh, the contrast in, in the, those two personages uh, rings true a little bit to us in the sense of uh, well, I think especially this year on the economic level, uh, somebody like uh, Che Guevara, who was a physician who gave it all up to be a jungle fighter, that's, we kind of gave up uh, real jobs to join a band. Right. I've got a great quote here. Um, somebody in the band described yourselves as being, quote, we want to make intelligent music and play it like mindless fools. We got the second half right so far, and we're working on the first. We got the second half of that right, and we're working on the first half now. So eventually, we'll get we'll get them both. Right? But um, and you've been getting great uh, critical acclaim. I mean, the album's not available. Well, it is available here in the bunker this weekend, but it hasn't been released in the UK. But in the states, it's got tremendous reviews, and you've been doing really well. I mean, yeah, it was part of a conscious plan, and I might suggest this for all aspiring bands. So right around Christmas time last year, we sent out Christmas puddings to all the uh, reviewers in the country, <laughs> along with a copy of the record, and it just delivers dividends uh, periodically. <laughs> Think about that. Oh, this is just crazy. <laughs> Steve, when did you learn to play trombone? You think, you think, uh, does, it sound, does it sound convincing? Did Those three notes, were they, were they coming through? Yeah. I tried a deal last night, it was a bit of an, I like to think of myself as kind of an innovator on the trombone, where I tried kind of slurring them together. Did you catch that part? Did you like that? <laughs> right. And sort of atonalism within the trombone uh, <laughs> atmosphere. So yeah, we're working on that. It's nearly as tall as you are. <laughs> but um, let's talk about the band sound. I mean, uh, how did the band sound develop? I mean, essentially, uh, it's it's like a progression of what all you guys have been doing. Cause you've all worked in each other's records for years, and suddenly you've come out with this excellent, clangy, raunchy sound. So, um, I mean, how did that develop? Was that just natural progression of being friends? And yeah, I mean, in a lot of ways it is. We're, we're very eclectic in our taste. Mm -hmm. Everybody has their... Uh, well, I think we all have common areas, and then we all have areas that have our own special interests. Mm. And uh, when Dave and Steve and I get together to write, uh, we we contribute to each other's ideas, and uh, thus the record. Or if you don't have the record, and most of you don't, I guess what you heard last night. You know, it's diverse kinds of uh, things to say the least. Except the uh, country song was totally uh, totally uh, Mike's idea. Well, it was inspired by his life story, so... <laughs> Mike, would you like to share your life story? <laughs> like, How did you get out of jail? <laughs> it wasn't jail, it was modeling school. <laughs> yeah, we put him in jail for posing as a model. <laughs> yeah, one thing we wanted to do... Uh, in putting the band together was to um, we aspired to be a live band and uh, we, we kind of started off there and uh, didn't really have any preconceptions tried to put the past aside and uh, start fresh get back down to ground zero and so what we did was we got to uh, we got to Nashville and got away from the uh, the rock business, music business structure in LA and New York went to Nashville so that we could, in a sense, germinate artistically and we began to write songs with uh, no real idea as to where we were going to land as far as a market for the music. I just tried to let it grow uh, naturally. Everybody brought their likes and dislikes to the table and we started, uh, we played virtually every punk bar in the South. and. Uh, when we went in to make the record, that's what the sound was. It was just uh, the band playing live and trying to capture live performances, uh, hopefully at a very good moment. Mm -hmm. Wade, 
You're very quiet in the corner. Uh, watching, yes. <laughs> So I believe you were the final member to join the band. That's um, right. So how did that come about? No, bad luck, actually. Um, <laughs> no, um, I was already living in Nashville. I'm from Nashville, and um, I was living there. I've known Dave for a long time. I've known Lynn, and and uh, I was in a another band, and we hadn't. Uh, we were together about a year, and um, they just they needed a bass player. Actually, they were talking about coming over here for, and um, so I just uh, got together with them one time and uh, they had a, another bass player from California and he moved back so I just uh, picked, up, picked up from there so mm -hmm. it's been uh, downhill since so. <laughs> it's been, it's been a, an exciting thing. Okay what I want to know now this is a really serious question is what is your favorite shoe size? I, I prefer larger sizes um, on stage you know people can see your shoes better and uh, I've just uh, recently began wearing shoes so <laughs> trying different sizes so. <laughs> so on a different note um, one of your major influences is the southern gothic writer Flannery O'Connor um, would you like to explain who she is and why she's been such a great musical influence on you, even though she's been dead for over 20 years? Well, it, the, the influence more or less came by, and just to even join in on this, the influence was uh, kind of discovered as, as an after fact. Uh, we put the music together, not consciously uh, uh, thinking, of, thinking of her, but uh, for Christmas last year, I got a compilation book of uh, authors that are in an American school of writing called the American Southern Gothic. And... Um, that, uh, that style tends to be very uh, obtuse in its imagery and it deals with uh, the freakish side of life quite often and the uh, strange angular elements of uh, human consciousness and behavior. And uh, in the front of this book, in this compilation, they had a very scholarly definition of the Southern Gothic and as I was reading it, I said, gee, that sounds, that sounds like us. And uh, immediately it, it dawned on me when I first met Steve uh, he was very much involved with uh, reading Flannery O'Connor, who's one of the foremost uh, examples of that type of writing. Uh, and I had been too, and in fact I went to the same university that she did and where her, uh, I guess you would say her archives are kept, and uh, was very influenced by other Southern writers like Tennessee Williams and William Faulkner. Uh, but that's, that's basically it. The next question is, huh, why are you guys so, such angry young men? I mean, your album, which is great, everyone should dash down the bunker and get a copy, end of plug, is incredibly, I mean, you just rail against everything. I mean, Rolling Stone magazine said that you're the most militant band since The Clash. And um, so, I mean, why are you railing against so many power structures and institutions and TV evangelists and people? And who writes the lyrics anyway? We just want to be kids again. <laughs> uh, well, the lyrics are a combination of Dave and Lynn and I sitting around and uh, bashing ideas about. And uh, when we have disagreements, we're all uh, reasonably uh, uh, well, uh, well uh, read in the martial arts, and so the last person standing uh, wins. <laughs> and. Um, uh, yeah, I think I think when you when you get the album and you uh, read the lyrics, there's a lot of uh, sort of militant discontent, but it's all leavened with a with a pretty good uh, sideways sense of humor. Um, uh, I think we all uh, are are fans of certain writers that uh, have a strong uh, social political bent, but uh, sometimes I think those writers kind of wear us out because they're just relentless um, railing against society. There's not enough not enough sense of humor. And uh, so I think that's one of the things is uh, you, you, you might say the song, a certain song is, seems to be about something, but it's always got uh, something sideways coming into it. And uh, uh, so I, I think we're, we're still pleased with the lyrics. Seem to still come across well. Can you give an example? Um, yeah, well, well the song, uh, we did a song called uh, The Song of the Monkey Grinder. And uh, I, I suppose we, we normally don't explain songs too, uh, too often or, or maybe too well, because if uh, someone comes up and they've got a better idea, then we'll say, yeah, that sounds good. We'll, we'll go with that for now on. 
But uh, this one as an overview is a bit about the corporate feeding machine we talked about last night. But um, the imagery, of course, is uh, of a little kid uh, uh, giving a, a, his nickel to a monkey, and the monkey's actually, you know, part of this big uh, organ grinder. But then the last verse turns the whole thing around, and it, it talks about the, the big long boa who's living under the house, and there's always something bigger to swallow the boss. And so, in a, in a sense, you know, just that imagery, I think, uh, communicated it better than uh, trying to be uh, too specific and uh, too polemic with the, with the uh, thoughts. Okay. Right, I'm now going to throw it open to all you lot. So it's going to be Daniel's in the lion's den. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Hey, you've already talked about the... Um so the militant discontent aspect of music. Um, how about, say, the evangelical side of it? Do you think that art and evangelism don't mix? Okay, I'll repeat that. Um, you guys who are militant evangelists do art and pop bands. Yeah, evangelism is... Merchants of militant discontent. Okay. Say. Do you think, what about the evangelical side? You're the merchants of militant discontent. What about the evangelicals? Oh, you did a good job. <laughs> now, I'm not as sharp as I was yesterday. Excuse us, folks. We saw the last dog hung last night. And I think his name was Rodney something. Um, I, please uh, take this in the right, um, in the right measure. And I'll, and I'll try to explain myself as fogged as I am today. Uh, I don't think at this point in time that in, in the uh, current sense of the word that we're an evangelical group as a group consciousness. Um, and, I'll, and I'll pretty much speak for myself on, on this. Uh, I think when we put the group together, we found that uh, uh, five believers were at different places. Uh, not in the deeper theological considerations and questions, but in the mechanisms. And uh, we felt that it would be um, difficult to put the group together on that. And, and I don't think at that time any of us really had an inclination to put the, the group together on that basis. And uh, I think at this point in time, if there's an evangelical sense to the group, it comes from, uh, I think, a, a, I believe a commitment on our part to live as godly a life as possible in oftentimes a, a very um, seemingly godless environment. It's kind of a one-on-one -on -one situation. Right. Okay. Yeah, I'll put that. Steve, how easy is it to write a lyric? Well, when I was when I was a solo artist and, and writing all the lyrics myself, it would normally take me like a long time to uh, work things through. But with this band, since we're working on lyrics together, it's a much more um, interesting process. Sometimes quicker, sometimes sometimes slower. But uh, we get together. We actually have a bunch of three by five cards. We've we've written ideas out on stuff like that. We just start tossing them around, and we'll see how a song sort of naturally develops between between the three of us, and how a concept will kind of grow out of a phrase or something like that. And um, the lyrics go through like a lot of trial by fire until they're at a place where we really feel like uh, they're saying what we want to say. Um, I was saying before, we don't like explain the meanings to the songs, but I, I will say this, is that all the songs have meaning to them. They're not uh, just randomly selected uh, imagery thrown together like, uh, you know, maybe early R.E.M. might have been or something like that. And so I think that they are lyrics that uh, are rewarding as people dig into them. Everybody agree? <laughs> <laughs> sure, whatever. Just don't let us for the rewards. <laughs> Okay. What's the meaning behind the wrong joke? Okay. What's the meaning behind the wrong joke? I should. I should. I'm gonna let Dave explain this one because he's the one who took the phone call. But let me start by saying it's it's all absolutely true. So uh, take it from there, Dave. Tell him how it happened. Take it, Dave. Well, that's the one song that it is randomly se selected imagery. Most of you guys haven't heard it, but it's a uh, it's a telephone call from uh, what one journalist in America called Alzheimer's Hell. 
uh, an old, an older lady, an older, like 95 years old, uh, called me looking for another David Perkins in Nashville, and uh, we went on a little bit of a magical mystery tour of a uh, telephone conversation that was picked up quite accidentally on my answering machine. I'd been bashing on a guitar in the basement and didn't hear the phone ring until the last ring. And I picked the phone up down there, and the uh, machine was upstairs, I couldn't turn it off, and went through this conversation, and uh, hung up and said, oh, that was strange, and went back to playing, and then a few minutes later said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, I got that on tape. So I back and listened to it, and it was, uh, uh, I kept it precariously on my answering machine for about three months, uh, and I'd queue up after that every day, could quite easily have gotten gotten erased and uh, when Lynn and Steve came uh, to Nashville for us to uh, see if we could write a song together and become a band I played it for them as a joke and, and they both uh, they both uh, were enamored by it and, and in fact they they came over here to work on a uh, on a project and Steve would call about every three days and say have you gotten that thing off your answering machine yet That's well did she ever get the real David Perkins uh, yeah, in fact, um, I don't know if she got him, but we, we had to find him because, uh, uh, interestingly enough, I had to call and have the exact same conversation with, with him. We had to call all the other Dave Perkinses and, and have a, a mirror image conversation, which was kind of like the um, episode of Star Trek where there was a, a good world and a bad world and a good Spock and a bad Spock. You remember that, don't you? <laughs> Okay, next question, please. Um, I'll take this one. Uh, Mike? Over there. Mike? How did you end up being signed to MCA? Okay, how did you end up being signed to MCA as opposed to a Christian label? Uh, I think none of the Christian labels really wanted us anyway. You know, that was the main thing. Uh, no, we just felt like we'd all worked in Christian music. I'd worked for a Christian label. I'm not going to say the name of it, but it was one of the biggest ones. And uh, Steve was on... Uh, a couple of those labels, so uh, he pretty much limited his options. Now, <laughs> Dave, Dave was too. Dave was uh, uh, on, on another label and, that I was working with. Yeah, we were all. I think we were all thought of as troublemakers in that marketplace, and um, so it just got to the point where we felt like there was a bit of a ceiling on what we could do there, and there was a bit of a frustration level. Uh, Steve just had the 1990 record out and was meeting uh, lots of resistance at radio and uh, retail levels and things like that. The cover was too scary for certain stores and, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> People thought it was a tarot card, which, which, it, which it actually it was, wasn't it, really? No, we could say that now, can we? Uh, but uh, anyway, it, it just seemed to be, at that point in time, a rather uh, limiting proposition for us and uh, uh, the mechanism to get music out and all that is, it seems to be much more limited. And uh, we didn't view ourselves as, uh, you know, Christian artists, but uh, we viewed ourselves as artists who are Christians. So, we, uh, you know, we felt like we needed a broader place to uh, allow our music to be exposed. And so we gave it a shot and uh, had several record companies come around and uh, attempt to sign us and we finally uh, chose one for better or for worse. <laughs> so that's the story there. What, one thing to understand is that the, in the United States there's a fairly significant gulf between uh, the Christian marketplace and the marketplace of the real world, so to speak. And uh, those, uh, those two elements are often mutually exclusive, but much more so the Christian marketplace going out into the mainstream uh, culture. And uh, all of us, everybody on, on this row, uh, at whatever junction we were involved, through the mechanisms of, of the religious record business and, and uh, Christian music and business in the United States, were about the business of trying to hurdle that chasm and found it uh, fairly impossible. Brief moments of 
uh, grasping certain uh, certain little snatches of possibilities. Uh, but I think we recognize that if you're going to go there, you've got to use the machine that fuels that. Um, so that's why we uh, decided to, to not try to go with a Christian label, but to go with a uh, regular record company. One other thing on that, uh, that's one of the reasons why I was keen on having the guys come over and, and see Greenbelt is because I think it's one of the few places where that gap is uh, effectively effectively bridged and, and where the two worlds, you know, have some meeting and contact. I think it's one of the one of the great things about the festival, so. Okay, question from here. Okay. Well, I'll tell you this. Uh, original plan, I was going to wear a ski mask and then they... <laughs> yeah. It's not going to help that Steve keeps making us carry his bags, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Steve who? <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question, please. Okay, in the black here, yeah. We came before Tim Machine, didn't oh, we? Yeah, we're gonna... <laughs> well, it was interesting um, in that it was, a, I mean, in, a, in a, my little world, it was interesting to see a guy like David Bowie go what many would perceive as um, going from being a, a solo artist to working within a band um, and presumably a collaboration. Uh, this was even more so that situation because this band is an honest to goodness. Uh, democracy and um, uh, it, it really is a collaboration on all fronts and I think that's for me that's one of the rewarding aspects of it and uh, I would even even seen that on a, on a spiritual level too. the idea of dying to self well you really do that you don't necessarily have to do that or you can, you can think you're getting you're, you're you're okay when you're a solo artist because you're sort of in charge when you're in a band in this situation that's you know you're giving up yourself for the good of the group and I think that's one of the things that's uh, been good about being in this band so do you all write the songs together? I mean, I know that the album credits just Lynn, Dave, and yourself, Steve. Well, the, the three of us write the songs, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, then we bash them about with the band. Well, basically, the three of us put together all the truisms and deep things that Mike and Wade have said over the last few weeks, and uh, we just assemble them. <laughs> and you can tell that we say a lot. <laughs> Right at the very back there. What's Escher's World? Escher's World is where I am right now. <laughs> are you as well received in America in the Christian community as you are here? It's been uh, it's been very very good um, because we've not tried to market ourselves uh, up to this point. Uh, through the Christian channels over there. We've not had to deal with any of the uh, negative elements that might be there. It's basically whoever's really wanted to come to the party has come, and it's been all positive. Okay, question over here. What would be a major musical influence that you mentioned earlier that you had in diverse areas? Okay, uh, major musical influences? Anybody? Well, a group called The Majors. Do you remember that? I don't know. That's, that's always a difficult question to answer because uh, I think it would take, it would be a long list for each of us. You know, stuff stemming from the 60s and 70s and 80s and a couple of things from the 90s. Uh, I don't know, you know, so it's, a, it's always hard to, you know, we all, you know, like everything from The Clash or The Beatles to, I don't know, you name it, you know, a lot of obscure uh, polka bands that Mike has uh, played with. Uh, yeah, has played with actually, and uh, he has a vast polka collection. Steve has uh, an ABBA thing. <laughs> he wears he wears platforms back in the hotel room. <laughs> I won't say what else he wears. <laughs> it's quite an ensemble, though. We'll say that, and. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> anyway, it's, as you can see, it's very diverse and possibly perverse, so. <laughs> Yeah, where does Steve get his energy from and has he had dancing lessons and does he have a straight jacket that he goes into at night? Steve is the human personification of a great white shark. He's the perfect eating machine. <laughs> Terminator 2? <two. laughs> okay, next question, please. Um, beard at the back. <laughs> Okay. I think this is a chance to give you a plug about your two concerts, guys. Uh, the 29th, uh, we're playing in Peterborough, right? At the attic. Everybody be there. And uh, then the, the 6th, we're playing at the Marquee in London. And um, everybody be there with five friends. Every, everybody. <laughs> Bring friends and um, you're all invited. Huh? Yes, uh, it's not free, I don't think. But um, that's all we have. That's all we have planned right now. So it's it's easy to get to just to. Yeah, but we're open to coming back and doing uh, more. We'd like to do art. That's it. Bring friends, and um, you're all invited. Huh? Yes, uh, it's not free, I don't think. But um, that's all we have. That's all we have planned right now. So it's it's easy to get to just to. Yeah, but we're open to coming back and doing uh, more. We'd like to do Ireland. We'd like to do Scotland. Okay, so you know, Australia. tell your friends Australia. <laughs> Yeah, we, we, we wanted to go this trip, but it just didn't work out financially to be able to do it all. So, uh, you know, we'll, uh, we'll hopefully get to that and uh, write your, uh, tell your friends, tell your neighbors, write your congressman, or would it, would it be here? <laughs> write the queen. Write the queen, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how did you get your gig at the Marquee? Um, which, if anybody doesn't know, is one of the most famous rock venues in London. Well, it, that's... In the States, that's, that's what we're doing. That's basically all we're doing. We've only played two shows that would be uh, construed as being uh, of a Christian sensibility. This and uh, kind of a counterpart festival in the United States called Cornerstone. And uh, everything else that we play is... Uh, mainstream venues. <laughs> I think um, that it's important to remember that as uh, individuals uh, and as individual Christian believers, um, we are uh, responsible to God for our actions, and uh, we're Christians first before anything else, and all that has to fall fall under that. Um, unfortunately, there is a lot of cultural baggage that many people perceive as coming along with Christianity, and part of the uh, part of the work of this band is to try and separate that that part out so that uh, we're not carrying that weight around with us. Um, 
but of course you're always going to come across conflicts you're, you're going to come across darkness you come across uh, areas of potential compromise and it's those times when when the band you know has to get together and pray through those things and make the right decision before god so yeah yeah i think that uh, one thing that i reject is the sense that uh, it's all on the mega level that it has to be there uh, on an evangelical sense and i i, I really believe that the cornerstone of the kingdom of God comes in two places. One is unity of believers, and the other is uh, everybody letting their light shine so that men may see your good works. They can see you living your life and then give glory to God. It's not what you preach, it's not what you talk, it's what you, it's what you do. It's the way you live your life. And I, and I think in, in a sense that's, that's the starting point for this band. And uh, I, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, the, uh, the first song we played last night, Tale of the Twister, uh, is on a soundtrack record called Pump Up the Volume that I know is, is released here. <laughs> 